Yeah. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order, uh, 1036. Uh, is there any additions or deletions to the agenda? <coughs> Connie? Yes, I'd like to add Chase the Dinosaur. Use uh, your mic, please, so it's recorded. I'd like to add the book, Chase the Dinosaur. Okay, so we'll add that under new business to add 7.5. Anything else? If not, Connie's moving the agenda. Yep. All in favor? Carried. Uh, we have our delegation online already. Uh, Rosemary, thank you Hello. for coming. Um, yeah. And I'll just turn the floor to you right away. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have some slides. I, I, these are just to give a bit of background so you can see what I'm talking about uh, with this bar control agent for Russian olive. Um, yeah, I guess I just have to share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you see this slide? Uh, no, we can't. Uh oh, okay. We just might have to just change something on our end here. Mm, I don't know. Okay, if you should be able to now. Oh, okay. I'm just going to put it in slide mode now so that. How about that? So you probably share, you'll have to go share screen and then you'll have to, uh, which is in the middle on the bottom. And, right. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, select which screen you want to share. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, now I see. Okay. You see that now? Yep. Now we can see it. Perfect. Okay, um, so yeah, you probably are fully aware of the problems caused by Russian olive. Uh, I imagine you, you have a fair amount of it in your in your county, and it's uh, certainly a problem in the in the city of Medicine Hat as well. Um, but a, a few years ago. Uh, Canada got involved with a uh, biological control program that was initiated by the U.S. because they have huge problems down there. Um, you know, in states like uh, Colorado and uh, Idaho, Montana, where where the uh, the weedy tree is uh, is really taken over riparian areas in some locations. So, so we went um, to Europe. Like, there's a uh, there's a group of researchers that that are entomologists and and biologists that um, that search out uh, you know what possible natural enemies might be present that are specific on the weed that we're interested in. And this is going back to the the weed's home range. So, in uh, the project was started in two thousand and seven. And uh, we knew it was going to be a difficult uh, weed to control using biological control because of the potential conflicts of interest. Yeah, uh, as you know, a lot of farmers uh, going back to uh, the 1930s and 40s were planting planting it as hedge rows. They don't do so as much anymore, I gather, but but it's still. Um, it's, you can still see it in hedgerows uh, or as uh, shelter belt trees, um, uh, you know, on farms in, in your area. And, uh, and then also, also people grow it horticulturally in their backyards or their, uh, or their yards. So we didn't want to uh, destroy the plant, uh, to kill the plant or, or reduce its function. Uh, I, I guess it's, uh, you know, how it looks if it's a, of its tree grown horticulturally. So it, instead we decided um, to just look for, for uh, organisms, whether they be insects or other arthropods that would reduce the, the amount of seed produced because that's the main way it spreads. So uh, we did find um, a few things that feed on, on, uh, on the flowers and the seeds of, of this plant. 
and uh, we they went back to the native range uh, of the of Russian all of it, Serbia, Turkey, Armenia, Iran, um, and uh, parts parts of Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. And uh, the, we uh, decided to um, fully test the Serbian and the Iranian populations, but. But because of uh, yeah conflicts, political issues and, and conflicts in some of these countries, it was really hard to do the testing, which had to be uh, you know of the age and to make sure it'd be safe to release. Um, so we chose uh, the population in Serbia for for releases in North America, and uh, they introduced the organism. It's this uh, little mite you can't even see it with with your naked eye. Uh, it's only under our microscope. This is a picture of it <laughs> down here to the lower uh, right-hand side, uh, taken with an electron microscope. Uh, but the mite uh, it occurs in large groups, and it uh, feeds on the leaves, and it causes what are these deformities that are called galls. Uh, it's just areas of the, of the plant, where, where, through their feeding, they draw nutrients to themselves, and uh, thereby robbing the plant of nutrients, um, and you know, and uh, yeah, nutrients that would be going towards normal growth, including uh, fruit production, flower and fruit fruit production. Uh, so the most obvious, um, it's it's really subtle damage. So you just see that the leaves are a bit crinkled, and you'll find these little divots or uh, depressions in the leaf where where the mites gather and feed. And um, in the winter, the leaves just um, fall off the, off the tree as they normally do, but the mites um, move to the, the main woody stem and over winter in, uh, in the buds. So they're present in the spring when, when the buds burst and, and start growing again into shoots. So uh, yeah, they feed on the buds, leaves and shoots. And uh, yeah, they create those uh, those galls or deformities, uh, but they can cause significant reductions in fruit production. And uh, yeah, the, we did they did a lot of host specificity testing. Like we cannot release anything, uh, you know, that's foreign and that comes in that may uh, cause damage to our own vegetation, and uh, including crops and horticultural species. Uh, but um, but in this case, uh, we did get permission to release this because it's not killing the trees, it's just uh, stopping its spread. So they focused on testing plants that are closely related to Russian olive. And in this neck of the woods, we have uh, a couple of species, or I should say a few species that are, that are very closely related Russian olive. Uh, one wolf willow that's uh, in the same genus as as Russian olive, Iliagnus, and then buffalo berry or silverberry uh, has different common names, but Shepardia, there's a couple of species that grow on the prairie here. And uh, some, some of these also grow in British Columbia. So what they found out after years of testing, like this uh, started in, uh, well, I guess that would be in the uh, 1990s, late 1990s, uh, they found that was, the mite is really specific to Russian olive and, and there was no development on these other plants that are closely related. So I think we're pretty safe with it. And uh, the petition like the petition had to be re reviewed by experts, uh, like an expert panel of uh, scientists and, um, and CFIA get, gives the ultimate uh, decision whether or not to release uh, organism into Canada for biological control. But they, uh, after petitioning for a few years, uh, CFIA, CFIA, they weren't worried about uh, how safe the agent was to release in terms of feeding on other things. Uh, but uh, they were concerned that they, they might um, be effective because they realized that, uh, the potential of this weed as, as being a real detriment. Um, especially to our riparian areas. Um, and uh, it also affects, uh, yeah, it can also affect uh, 
our, you know, even the cattle industry, because uh, in places where cattle are, are ranged on, on native grassland, it can prevent them from getting to uh, watering holes, for instance. So there's a, a number of reasons that, why they want, want to see this plant controlled or not sp spreading around into nat natural riparian habitat. Uh, so it was approved just uh, last year, but um, it took us a while to get a colony uh, uh, from Europe, uh, but we received a shipment uh, uh, into our Lethbridge quarantine facility in the fall, in October. And we started uh, learning how to rear it on, on Russian olive saplings that were growing from seed. And uh, this was uh, done throughout the winter. You, uh, they can have multiple generations. And uh, so every few months, we just uh, transfer, transfer the mites to new uh, saplings that we've grown from seed. And, um, and then we also, it, uh, the purpose of doing this was to also to make sure for sure that we had the right mite species. So we, we did some DNA analysis as well of what we have and found out for sure it's it's the same mite. And we have even were able to get it uh, verified right to the very spot where it was collected in, in Serbia uh, based on the DNA. And uh, so we have also pur purified the colony because sometimes uh, with something this small too, uh, it could be imported with other hitchhiking uh, arthropods like uh, thrips, for instance, and so we made we've made sure that there's nothing else um, within the colony from Europe that came in, and so we're all set to go for for spring releases now. Um, targeting the hot spots for Russian olive is a problem in southern in interior of uh, British Columbia, and also in. Um, well, actually in Southern Alberta, but especially in the Medicine Hat area. And uh, so the first release was made one week ago. Uh, we shipped out uh, a number of galled leaves. You can see the little bumps. Those are the galls where the mites are. And we just ship, we shipped them uh, via perlator per to uh, Summerland. And uh, the buds have to be bursting, just emerging. Uh, at the time of release, which hasn't occurred here yet, I don't believe, um, in southern Alberta, but um, but it's been a slow spring even in the South Okanagan, in the Summerland area. Uh, but um, we're still learning how and where to release the mites. Uh, the first releases made of any new agent are experimental because we need to figure out uh, you know, where best, what kind of habitat or climate uh, are they going to do best in? And um, so that's the purpose. I, that's why I was uh, interested in, in figuring out if if uh, the Medicine Hat area or, or Cypress County, in this case, would be a, a good location to, to, to just see if they're going to survive, if they're going to establish, and then what happens after that. And learning how to uh, handle them and uh, release them is also part of that whole process of, of learning. Um, we've chosen to uh, protect them because they're they're quite fragile. We we cut up the leaves with the galls and mites and and try to shove them using forceps into the bud area. Uh, but um, you know you don't want them to dry out. Um, this time of year can be challenging with the wind as well. And uh, so the people, uh, the collaborators in Summerland, they're also with uh, Ag Canada or Agriculture Canada, but they've decided to use these uh, mesh cages just to protect the area where the mice have been placed initially. So that's something to keep in mind. Like if, um, if we're going to be do doing that in any location, uh, it's important that nobody vandalizes the, the release uh, um, that might be a difficulty, I don't know, um, in finding sites that are protected. But uh, but that's about all I have to say. Uh, yeah. Um, and if you have any questions, um, yeah, we're, we're just excited. Every time we get a new agent that's been approved, it takes years of work and, and to get to that point and, and uh, hopefully seeing them take off and to do what they're supposed to do is... Uh, that's exciting as well. That's what keeps us going. <laughs>
Okay, thank you, Rosemary. Is there any questions? I, I guess I have one. Um, yeah. Are they, how do I word this? So it, it limits in fruit development. Uh, does it take and do any stunting to growing plants at all? Like, it, uh, uh, like juvenile or rational, would it stunt it so it yeah. doesn't grow as fast? No, no. I yeah, that's a good question because there is there is some uh, reduction in shoot growth that occurs, but it doesn't seem to um, yeah, it doesn't seem to affect the, the the appeal or the appearance of of the of the tree. And uh, you know, this is actually this is the only agent possible agent that we have, uh, you know, the or a candidate that we have currently. So I don't. This pro uh, project isn't going to continue at this point. Uh, there, there just isn't anything else that's this host specific and that is, uh, you know, has a low impact on the appearance and, and the function of the tree. So there's nothing else uh, that's out there right now. Okay. So, um, so this is this is it. <laughs> so in the city of Medicine Hat, where are we finding the biggest Russian olive population? Is it along like the Seven Persons Creek area? Yeah, uh, yeah, and it, I, I'm trying to remember. Uh, like, it, there's a park. Um, Waste oh, Point. Mines. Yeah, yeah. Um, like Mary, Mary Lou's been. I haven't been actually uh, to the locations she's picked out, but there's a. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Like the. Uh, yeah, my mind is uh, probably Kim Cooley as well. Yeah, yeah, she's shown some pictures. Like what I think what we're looking for too. Like she says, it might be bad. They might it might be better for them to find a uh, location, um, you know, on a creek uh, or going into the river valley uh, for for this release. I'm I'm not sure. There, like there's some in the in the city parks, I guess. Uh, the plants, they're not sure of the history, but they probably were planted at the same time all uh, PFRA had that shelter belt program and some of the trees were brought in then. Yeah. So uh, I, I guess I know a little bit of history on that because I live right on the Seven Persons Creek. Um, okay, yeah. So a lot of that Russian olive has been brought in by the creek when it floods. So uh, if you look at any of the low-lying areas, they're just full of them. Right. Where, wherever the water touches. So yeah. I, I'm guessing the seeds settled there as, as the floods came through and yes. it, it brings a population with it. And whether it comes all the way from, it, it could essentially come from the whole watershed essentially because who knows where it actually originated from, but there there's always new Russian olives that are growing along there. Right. So, right. so if, you're, and... if you're looking in Cypress County, following that creek back and uh, trying it in sourcing there, that'd probably be your best bet. Would that be in within city limits? Because we're we're hitting a bit, you know, a bit of a roadblock there. It's not that we can't make make releases, but the city has a, a list of conditions that we just wouldn't be able to meet for this spring. Yeah. Uh, no, it'd sure. be all outside the city limits. Okay. There's yeah. about there's about thirty miles of creek outside of city limits and it there's Russian olives all the way along it. And even, okay. even if you're looking out of the riparian areas, a lot of our county roads and whatnot, pretty much anywhere, right. anywhere there's a power line beside a ditch, there's Russian olives growing in it. Okay. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's good to know. And like you said, you know, I think there's, uh, there's more evidence coming out of the states. Um, they've been doing some remote sensing and, and tracking what's going on with their uh, Russian olive and in invasions into uh, new riparian areas and uh, floods definitely are involved. Um, and it's because the seeds are buoyant and they can, um, yeah, just float along and, but they can accumulate during a flood period as well. And they get deposited, you know, on floodplains and yeah. in the long the, creeks. Yeah. Well, and the birds are really good at moving them around too, we found yes. out. So, and, that, yeah, and that's why they're all under all the power lines. Right. Um, like I do have some riparian area that's right around or right along some county roads that I'd be interested in. If you guys are interested in, it, we could probably do something. Sure, with sure. Um, now to to let you know that um, you know our colony is quite small, and uh, you know if it doesn't turn out for like if you guys are interested and are willing to help, uh, 
if it doesn't turn out for this spring, uh, we're going to continue rearing and we could be looking at, a, a, you know, release this uh, next next spring as well. And uh, like because uh, because the province of BC, they, they fund a lot of the overseas work. And so they, you know, they uh, when Canada came on board, it was because of BC and they uh, they provide some funding towards uh, the overseas testing so i want to make sure that they you know they get uh they might um be able to make one more release this spring as well okay um, well yeah, yeah. Well, i think we'd be interested in in working with you but uh if it's not the spring next spring's fine too you know it's it, you let you guys get your establishment done and then we can go from there yeah well, but the other thing too is that we're beginning to realize is that like as it's, as we experiment with even how to release release the mite, it's nice to have them closer to home, and so uh, we do have some Russian olive, for instance, uh, on the research uh, uh, research center property. It's quite large, and um, so we were thinking of even making a few releases there. That way, we can just walk out and check on them, you know, and. Um, and even uh, try a few things out. So we might have a by next spring we may have some uh, some technique that's worked out that's better. But at this point, it's all experimental. Okay. Well, I think uh, go ahead, Kim. My question is, how do they winterize like the mites? Like I know yeah. Serbia has a, a cold climate, but I'm just curious if there's any correlation to here. Yeah, well, but they did find, yeah, for, for instance, in places in Turkey where they, they were, they were higher elevation. So, yeah, they, uh, they are tolerant to uh, cold, uh, but, you know, whether they're tolerant to the extremes in temperature that we have here and, uh, and the wind as well. Uh, you know, I imagine, I imagine uh, Lethbridge and, and medicine, medicine Hat are similar in that regard. But I, um, but that's why I'm curious. Like I, I can't promise they're going to establish, um, but we usually do try to match the climates as as close as possible uh, to what to where they're found overseas. But um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, they overwinter, as I mentioned. They uh, the mites uh, crawl from the leaf like the shoot, uh, the new shoot that where they're established on and leaves and, and the fruits and flowers uh, in the fall. And they crawl to the wood, you know, the established woody part of the branch. And then they burrow into the um, the buds that are all set uh, or dormant buds that, that are set for winter. And uh, they just uh, kind of hunker down on, you know, in the buds and and up. Uh, Probably under the bark as well until until the following spring. That makes sense. Lisa, go ahead. Um, hi, this is Lisa. I've been hi. emailing you a bit. Um, so, Siwa, like Mary Lou, is going to go and check um, out at Cavan Lake next week when she has some of her, her summer staff. So, they were going to check on the suitability of that location. Um, I don't know how that would be for the vandalism though, like if it's gonna be an obvious yeah. little tent, you know, a trap or, you know, the mesh kind of thing put in the tree that might be too obvious then. Yeah. Um, but we do have a few other locations that we've been kind of looking at and I've got um, contacts for the landowners so we can, you know, make a few phone calls and see if anybody else is willing to do that too and and they're you know close by the office and that too so if there's any kind of mm -hmm. monitoring or something that you would want us to do then you know we could oh, okay. do that for you too yeah yeah and we're like we're definitely uh, myself and my staff are willing to come out and uh, make the release and uh, and we can pr provide some training and and uh, show and tell as well uh, but uh, I, I, I would really appreciate help as well. You know, it's, um, that's a nice thing about the biocontrol programs too, is, is getting involvement from those that, that are benefiting, potentially benefiting from the agents as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I, and just one more question. Um, if it was the county or um, just private landowners, is there an agreement or something that would have to be yeah. signed? Do you have something like that? Yeah, or? yeah there is. Um, they're getting, uh, yeah, our cap is getting stickier on that. Um, it, so there, it's a simple agreement. It's a land access agreement. And um, okay. it, it, yeah, for private landowners, especially, I, I'm not sure if it's uh, like if it's a, yeah, the provincial park. Um, I'm not sure that would be up to you, I guess, to uh, the the land managers or, or the county as to whether you want, would want a, an agreement in place. Okay. It it's more to uh, protect both sides, right? Like if something were to happen, but but in like in this case, um, the agent is safe, and you know it's not going to go on a rampage or anything. Yeah. Uh, but but in terms of uh, us accessing property, that that's an issue too, right? Like if if we were to get hurt or something, you know, it kind of protects yeah. both sides. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, Kim. Sorry, just one more question. So when when you establish a, a colony, so mm -hmm. the next year you would just kind of harvest those those uh, leaves and then transport them to another uh, another um, area or is that's how you grow the population yeah uh but yeah normally like once like what what happens in the lab is really different from what happens in the field and and so what i think it'll probably take like if it establishes and survives a winter it's probably going to take several years for it to get well established and Hopefully, to increase the population, increase in not in size, to and uh, it's usually when densities come up. Um, and again, I have no idea how long that that would take. But uh, once the numbers come up, then the mite will disperse on its own. And they're so tiny, you, th you think, well, how how can it do that? But they what they do is they're they, they are. They belong to the spider group, so they spin these little threads, and they um, and they get, you know, I guess uh, during a wind, they can be dispersed that way. Yeah, um, they just fly through the air <laughs> with this little uh, webbing of uh, stringing along, and I guess then they when they come to another tree, it's it's just by a random chance that they find uh, they land on another tree. And uh, I guess the th thread help is kind of like a lifeline that allows them to get reattached to the vegetation. So that's how they spread. Well, now that I know they're arachnid, I'm not really happy about it, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, yeah, they're, they're weird looking, you know, like they're, they look like little wriggly sausages when you look at them under a microscope, <laughs> but uh, they don't look like a, a spider at all. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess uh, keep us in the loop on what you need from us, and we can work with it that way, I guess. For sure. Uh, I really appreciate this. Um, yeah, again, it's, you know, if I can, like our, our whole purpose, uh, our program's purpose is to help uh, landowners and, uh, and managers deal with, uh, with these uh, pest plants and and we always hope it's going to work. Yeah, like, but like I said, I can't guarantee anything. But you know, uh, I appreciate your help in allowing us to to figure out figure out how how best to to use this agent as well. Okay, perfect. Well, I guess we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your okay. time and your presentation. Yeah. And yeah, just anything you need, get in contact with Lisa, and we can go from there. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Go ahead. Kim. Lisa, another uh, good, because we've already established uh, landowner um, access and it's wind sheltered and it's in, there's lots of Russian olive there. There's a, there's a lot of Russian olive down there. The whole Seven Persons Creek is covered yeah. in them. So. But that would be a, a, a pretty good location because we do have access already established and, and uh, we purchased a lot of land there. Yeah. Cypress County did. Yeah, there's, there's pretty good access right off my place because it's right off a uh, road allowance too if you... And if we can control them, I'd be real happy because they're hard on chainsaws. Okay, uh, minutes from the February 28th meeting. Any errors or omissions there? 
Seeing none, Shane's moving that. All in favor? Carried. Um, Egg supervisory report, Lisa. Okay, so the Egg Service Board grant has been increased this year to 166,000 from the 123,000 that we've received since 2020. So that's just for the legislative stream. So that was good news. Uh, Minister Nate Horner was very pleased to announce that. <laughs> Um, and then the funding for the resource management will remain at 20,000 and the rat control stream will remain at 13,000. And then the 2022 grant report um, must be submitted by June 30th, but I'm trying to have that in this week so I can get that out of the way before all the summer kids start. <laughs> Uh, the brand bait applicator, uh, we ordered that in March and the unit should be available for rent to uh, anybody with grasshoppers uh, for this summer. Um, there's eco brand available that I know of for sure at the co-op. Um, just one thing though, it is registered as an agriculture product so it is not intended for residential use so you know that could limit a little bit of people you know thinking if it was going to be on tiny acreages or something like that but anyway um rental equipment so there's quite a few producers on the list for the seed drills and the first one went out on april 21st and i think there's one on the list for a land roller right now um, so an update to the Alberta Farm Fresh Producers Association at the last meeting, there was a motion that we um, sponsor their conference, $500, but that was cancelled last minute um, due to a low registration numbers, so um, we did not send that money. A letter was drafted um, about lab-grown meat and it was emailed to the Alberta beef producers on March 13th, wondering if there was any effort in battling those products at all and I have not had a reply from that yet. Mm -hmm. Summer staff will be starting on May 1st, so we're supposed to have seven. Um, we're having a hard time finding the seventh person. I think I've maybe got somebody lined up now, but six for sure will be starting on Monday. Um, Braden was modifying the spray trucks. Um, the spray booms now have actuators on them so we can adjust those nozzles a bit more to um, kind of alleviate some of the spray drift and, and target more specific patches, so that'll be handy. Training and meetings. Um, we attended the Alberta Invasive Species Council Conference in Olds on March 7th and 8th. And there's been many webinars that we've attended and different committee meetings and, and things like that. So there's been Ag Service Board information updates, rodent control. We've listened to a few different ALICE presentations and EFP and AAAF and all those fun things. The tree care workshop was very successful. <laughs> We had over 80 people in attendance there. Um, we had lots of positive feedback and suggestions for future workshops, so we hope to use some of those ideas um, for future webinars or workshops or things like that. Um, we've had a few calls regarding control for Richardson ground squirrels, of course, and one guy had asked about burrow oat bait in early March and if the county would stock it and offer a subsidy to the farmers. Um, there's an egg retailer that carries that though, so he was told that we wouldn't. We don't want to take the business away from the local retailers. Um, we've had several calls about badgers in the county and specifically in Suffield for some reason. Um, we don't have any policies in place to deal with badgers and our live traps are too small for people to use. Um, unless they're a risk to public safety then Fish and Wildlife will not use them or help with any of that either. So I just keep suggesting um, the little smoke bombs. <laughs> you can buy them at co-op on the 120. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. 
coyotes, we've also had quite a few kind of, uh, calls about them. And again, unless there's predation, we can't do anything about them. And fish and lot, wildlife will help if there's a risk to public safety in the hamlets. What were they, when they were concerned about the coyotes, was it just the lots of them or were they attacking livestock? Um, some calls have been just wondering if they could be prepared because there was a few kind of hanging around their herds and I'm like well until there's predation I can't give you anything. There was also a call from Vinerville because there was a lot of them up there and it seemed that there was one or two even stalking a couple little kids in the park one night so. Yeah see that it's interesting because I've got a lot of coyotes. And I've, the other day, there were six of them in with the herd. Mm. Well, one thing I noticed was I don't seem to have as many gophers because mm. coyotes do eat gophers. Yeah. You know, so if you start getting rid of your coyotes, mm -hmm. your gopher problem, I mean, I haven't had lost a calf from them, but they're, they're out and about. But. And that's good. Like, they learn to hunt, like to take down a calf and stuff. So if you haven't lost any, then that's a good sign that they haven't been taught that. So there's too many gophers for a need. And yeah, so that's okay. Huh. You got something, Blaine? Well, I just gonna say the key to keeping go or the coyotes at bay is pick up your deads. Mm -hmm. Like they don't that too, yeah. generally take down a live calf. I mean, they'll they'll eat what's there. So if you leave them scattered out there, they're going to, then they'll get used to it and then they'll, you know, get the taste. But if you, I know, I mean, if a buddy of mine were delivering bulls on Saturday and we were talking about this whole thing and if people pick up their deads, not a, it doesn't create a big problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the food truck, um, we were asked to reach out to country in the city uh, to propose a collaboration on bringing the, the food truck to the Medicine Hat Stampede. Um, so this year their fee has increased. It's $3,500 a day and I didn't realize that before I thought it was $2,500 for the event but on their website it's $3,500 a day. Um, anyway that gal got back to me last night and said that they have temporarily confirm the truck to be there um, but in the email she said that they thought it was going to be no cost so I don't know about that but she's waiting for confirmation on that and then we'll kind of let us know I guess but God, that seems awfully pricey it sure does no we can't no. afford to do that it's, it's I, there's not enough value to it for that no so depending what kind of comment she gets back, then we'll see maybe, but. Go ahead, Connie. Yeah, it's free if the schools bring it in. So it was meant for the schools to bring in. Right. Mm -hmm. but. I think public education is public education when you take and you look at the variety of people and the amount of people you're gonna get through it at some place like the Stampede, mm -hmm. I figured that would have more of a cause to it than bringing it to a school would, but. At, at a price like that, that's just not unfeasible to even think about. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a $9,000 week for Stampede. So unless they've made, you know, different arrangements because it would be a multi-day thing, maybe they'll do some kind of a discount or something. But, <laughs> but she suggested that we contact the general manager for other sponsorship deals or whatever because I guess they think they're getting this for nothing. So, <laughs> but... I know, and I thought that in my head, you know, what you guys always say, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Dutch elm disease. Um, so, basically, Stop Dead has their provincial program. The county has seven traps that we put up for them, so um, kind of along the main corridors and at the borders. Um, Every year, they, you know, they seem to find a few of the elm bark beetles throughout the province. And yeah, we're just going to kind of stay helping with that and stay vigilant. There's been two cases of Dutch elm disease in the province in the last number of years. So we're doing pretty good so far. So 
and we'll do those traps again this year for them. And there's a spreadsheet and items of information if you want to see the beetles or whatever. And then the rabies contractor, um, I've got a info brief on that too, but basically they have cancelled the active surveillance program. Um, but if there's going to be, you know, animals out there, domestic or wild, that show symptoms of possible rabies, then of course they would test that and, and that sort of thing. So the entire program isn't gone, but just the active surveillance that we have participated in is. So um, therefore we don't need to hire the contractor. He's been given his notice and you know, find other employment for the year since we can't give it to him. And and now we've got $5,000 that we're saving from that program, so. Connie probably already has it spent. <laughs> <laughs> Just what I thought. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, we have some were. funding for the <laughs> And then, of course, the Russian Olive Program, but I don't need to go through that. We just heard that. So um, uh, so I have a few more things that kind of came from yesterday. So the biocontrol, other biocontrol, I've ordered um, some releases for Russian knapweed and leafy spurge. So Alberta Environment and Parks will give us five free releases. So those will be kind of included in that. It has to be along bed and shore. And we've ordered more like additional leafy spurge releases and generally we get $8,000 grant from Alberta Environment and Parks for that as a separate program. So most of those are covered by that grant. And then I'm going to order, um, I think about three releases for diffuse knapweed. So we're going to pay for those and we're going to try those Shane on uh, pipeline grazing because <laughs> there's a huge patch on the south side of the tracks I don't think we've sprayed it so it'll be a site worth trying them on they can't be used on anything that's been controlled before so hopefully that'll you know just to try it and see hopefully we can get some good results from that mm -hmm. Um, we're going to have an in-person Alice meeting with that gal on May the 8th. And I think Connie and Shane and Blaine were going to attend that. Um, Brayden and I went and rolled grain bags at Josh's the other day. We had about eight maybe or something like that. So that was good. And then we found out yesterday that there's going to be some Americans coming up on Friday to do a podcast about the rat control program. <laughs> so this happens occasionally. They get in contact with the provincial rat specialist and she usually sends them out wherever. Usually lately she sends them to Acadia Valley, um, but he can't do do it on Friday so she and they are going to come here so we'll go and do some inspections and just kind of tell them what we would normally be doing so I don't think there will be any video this time we've had different productions you know that have been on video and stuff too but this one is just a podcast so it should be just a conversation kind of thing so so that'll be this Friday so that'll be fun <laughs> And that's it. Anybody got questions? <laughs> Any questions? Go ahead, Connie. Yeah, just a comment. I did go to Tozo's um, uh, tree, care? Tree, tree care thing, and I think it would be nice to have, like, because that was a three-hour thing, and it was one person talking the entire three hours. I think it, in in future seminars, it might be nice to have more than one speaker. Because I think after three hours, it's kind of tiring to, to talk that long. And you just get a different perspective as well. So that would have, yeah, but it was a good good thing. Um, so, and in terms of that trailer, like Hilda, Hilda Days is coming up. So, I mean, if we're not spending 5000 on that, maybe they could bring that trailer out to Hilda. Um, hmm? The Egg for Life trailer food truck that food truck it's funny to call it a food truck when it's <laughs> a f truck about food growing food it's, yeah 
Ja. Bringing it in the city. Yeah. 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 That would make more sense. Maybe. Use your mics, guys. But Hilda is 100% egg. Yeah. Yeah, bringing it into some place like Dunmore for Dunmore days would make sense. Yeah. If we're, we can talk about that more after. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions from Lisa's report? And I was just going to say, Connie, that um, like Toso offered that. He offered full day um, workshop or four hours. <laughs> so he was prepared to do all of that. So, but yeah, yeah. It felt quite long listening to one person. Yeah, no, I agree. So, yeah. yeah. And yeah, like we can take that and, you know, yeah. we were thinking about that just from some of the comments that we got, like we had really good suggestions yep. and stuff on the evaluation form. So we were thinking of having, you know, another workshop with, like you say, a couple speakers just to break it up and touch on a few different areas, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I was surprised by there was like a whole table from the colonies yeah. so yeah it was it was very well attended like trees yeah everybody loves their trees mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah good job guys yes <laughs> <laughs> uh kate uh blaine's moving lisa's report uh there's no seed plant report. Didn't oh, okay so i forgot to put it on there so okay all in favor Carried. Uh, 7.1 skunk and rabies surveillance program changes. We already touched on this, but. So yeah, again, it's just an information brief there for you. Just the government decided that there wasn't, you know, enough justification in keeping an active program going. So they suspended it for three years. And then the plan is to revisit and see if it's worth suspending it again or bringing it back. And of course they will do testing in the meantime and they will bring it back if, if it turns out that all of a sudden we've got all these rabies cases turning up in the province, they would bring it back again. But there just hasn't been anything for such a long time. It's, you know, to do active, like searching for skunks to trap and euthanize doesn't make a whole bunch of sense at this point, they figure, so. Just follow your nose. Yep. Uh, any comments on this, guys? No. Connie's going to move for information. Yep. Okay, all in favor? Yep. Carried. Uh, Alberta Range Stewardship Course Sponsorship. So um, we were approached um, about the Alberta Range Stewardship course. It's a two-day event, and it's going to be hosted down at Cottonwood, um, Shane's neighbors there, um, on July 5th and 6th. And so it's a two-day thing and targeted to producers, of course. Um, and they just go through all kinds of range management and stewardship and plant ID and just different things like that. So they wondered if we would be in for sponsoring them $500 for that event. Um, I've talked to a few different people about this kind of randomly. And the first ask was from somebody else and they wondered if we had porta potties and stuff like that. And I said, well, no, we don't have that, but we'll gladly advertise it for you. And so that was good. And then somebody else had reached out and wondered for the $500. So. Um, so that's up for consideration if you want to. Go ahead, Shane. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to donate five, sponsor five, uh, do a $500 sponsorship. Okay. Okay. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay, uh, preparing for Canada Gap webinar series sponsorship. So to be fair, I don't really know about this program. It was new to me. I didn't know if Connie knew about it though. Yeah. Of course Connie knows about it. <laughs> so yeah, through Alberta Farm Fresh, there was lots of members who are part of Canada Gap. So it's kind of like a certification. Um, when you're selling fresh 
produce. Right. So yeah, they have to meet all this criteria. I think it involves, like it's quite, quite involved. Um, yeah, once like you have that certification, it opens a lot of doors. Oh, okay. Because it's a multi-week yeah. thing, you know, webinars or whatever that they, they put on. So they've reached out to a number of municipalities hoping, you know, just for some help because it's a bit pricey if you do it on your own kind of thing. Um, in here, it was just over $600 that they were hoping for. I've had a, a more recent email saying that it's probably going to be a little bit more because they have had to make a few changes to the program. Um, so, I mean, if we're interested, then I can reach out and see if they've got a more up-to-date dollar value, you know, that they would require. But, um, yeah, like I didn't know if it was something that they reached out to us because we're in the sunny south or you know we yeah. would have more people that are interested in that or not or well i'm wondering if this would apply to the greenhouses it does okay so apparently yeah it, it field or greenhouse crops yeah. they said yeah yeah it might be worth like or if we just want to I don't know. advertise for them yeah advertise and kind of yeah. get a feel to see how many cypress county people would be interested in even paying to take it yeah. and then maybe sponsor it another year yeah like i'm not sure it's entirely up to you but yeah, that, makes, that makes more sense than throwing money at something that we're not even sure if it's even that anybody's interested in so yeah. if we advertise it and see like there's a following of people that would take part in it and we can look at it yeah. down the road okay mm -hmm. good by me yep so that's your motion, that is my motion. <laughs> okay okay any other discussion no all in favor of whatever advertising, advertising for uh, Canada Gap carried okay 7.4 So ATTS group, so this is Toso, the guy who did the tree care workshop. We've hired him in the past um, for a one-year contract, and, and this time it's $1,500 for a year. And you get a webinar or a workshop type thing. Um, you get all his fact sheets and his advice. Like sometimes we have to use the provincial lab in Edmonton for the diagnosis of diseases and, and different things. But I mean, it's all in language that we can't understand, but he can. So, so often we're, you know, asking him for his advice and his interpretation of the results of lab testing and stuff. Um, we're, you know, getting tree questions often from people lately just wondering about bugs and disease and and watering and mulching and like all those things how do they keep their shelter belts alive and and what's good to plant and and all that kind of stuff so he's just a very good resource so um even at the workshop he had offered this program and stuff to us and the county of 40 mile because they you know co-hosted that or whatever too so go ahead blaine so did you say this includes like his his um thing you guys just did what do you call that the uh, workshop, the workshop? Does, yeah, this include that workshop or is that no because oh. we were kind of in between contracts at that point and and because we split everything with 40 mile anyway then it kind of worked out that way but oh. we could have another one i know lots of people were interested in specifically uh fruit tree pruning and stuff like that and or it could be a, a webinar, you know, something like that this fall or winter again or type thing, so. Go ahead, Connie. Oh, what was I gonna say? Shoot. Is that the old timers? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so at the seminar, Tozo said he doesn't want individuals phoning him, then he'd get like a million calls. So he likes to go through Lisa, um, and then Lisa would share all the county concerns with 
with him and get the answers. Is that the impression you got? Yeah. yeah. Because he's got his own business, so he doesn't have time to be answering questions from who knows. I mean, he goes all over the province doing these things. So he doesn't have time to answer individual questions and stuff. So, you know, at least we're compensating him. So when I bug him for something, he doesn't mind, right? So. Yeah, I think we brought this up last year and it worked out fairly well. Yeah. So. And now we've got the extra 5,000 from the rabies. <laughs> yeah. well, I think we budgeted for this anyways, didn't we? Um, we, we did it all, we did it last year as well. Yeah, the year before. The year before? Yeah. It was the tail end kind of of 21, I think. So yeah. we just well, kind of missed out. I think it'd be more useful tool than the skunk one for sure. I mean, I never was doing pay for that one anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so you're moving? Yeah, I'll move, I'll move that we put them on our, because like you said, I think with more and more with all the acreages that we have and and whatnot, it seems like there would be a lot of questions with different trees and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. Yeah. Okay, sure. yep. any other comments on that? Yeah, one, one thing I, you know, Tozo brought up is that we're planting shelter belts, like just one species or whatever. And he says, like, the best ones are the ones with, like, 20 or 30 species and you know at some point is there a place or something where we set up a demonstration shelter belt or you know got a place for us Connie well I thought we had land on the 120 <laughs> yeah we do it, it, I think it has a dairy farm on it right now oh. <laughs> yeah I don't know it was just something that it just popped in my head but I don't know give it some thought yeah no it's a go ahead Kim there is uh, some land, if you're looking at a good shelter belt location on the, um, on the west side of Seven per or sorry, of Irvine, outside of where the campground was, we own the next 40 acres adjacent to that on the west side. So that would be a... Uh, well, you know, we could look at doing one in Dunmore here too as well. Yeah, well we're gonna it, be anywhere within a hamlet we could look at. Yeah, but you're looking at an expense. I mean, all of a sudden, you need to water it, and you need to look after it and everything. Mm -hmm. I think just these webinars and just, you know, mm -hmm. if, if doing enough, I think. I think Instead. if it's something we want to do, we could probably partner with a community association, and then they would take care of it and whatnot. But go ahead. We actually already have an established shelter belt at Cabin Lake. There's three different species in rows. So, and then all that land going west is also owned, or in lease with the county so that is something that if you I was out there last year and there's certain species of those trees that are really struggling because they're at their age and that might be a, another location because that's so you know that's not a bad idea yeah just only there that up. and it gets watered by our caretaker that's a better idea. you already got some infrastructure like something in place happening so I agree because even the wife went to that deal and how they said you don't plant all the same species of trees because if they get a disease, then you lose them all. So you should, every other one be different so you don't lose all your trees. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a better idea out to Kevin. Yeah. So we've tried different wind or uh, shelter belts and stuff out there. We tried planting some like between the campground and the lake and stuff and they just had a hard time because everybody just always expects that irrigation for lawn or grass is enough for trees and it's not mm -hmm. is the problem so unless you're standing there with a hose watering each individual tree it's really hard to expect them to grow go ahead Shane. no a and like they learned there, you don't water at the base of the tree, the side. So you just you plant your tree, and then you have a ditch about two feet away or a foot away, and they can just run the hose. And then once the ditch fills up, yeah, if there's something or or you have to do it, and you can put down this black uh, soil matting around your trees too, which helps the moisture not evaporate so bad. And but there is ways. Go ahead, Connie. Well, maybe this is something for the money we're going to pay Tozo that he looks at that and gives us a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I don't know. 
Yeah. Say, Tozo, you're going to work for it. <laughs> yeah, at me, you would. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know if I got a move or a motion or what now. <laughs> I'll make a motion that's I think Bla looking. actually no Blaine Blaine did, so we just didn't vote on it. Connie got talking and I got Okay, so what's the motion? So the motion's to uh for the fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think you can just bring that up with him and see where it goes. Well so it does we it does say sorry, but it does say in there to contract, you know, him basically. So he's kind of on contract for advice for the fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. So I mean if we have it or questions when it comes to the shelter belt or whatever, I mean that should, you know, that $1,500, <laughs> that's what that's about. So. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Okay. okay. All in favor of that? Carried. Uh, okay, Connie, I don't remember what your topic was, but. Oh, chase a dinosaur? Oh, yeah. So, um, the grandmother of Summer Straub, who wrote Chase a Dinosaur, picked up my book, and so... She told me about her granddaughter who wrote Chase the Dinosaur. So she lives out by Hilda. She wrote this during the pandemic. Uh, she's selling it on Amazon, I believe. And I think she sold around 150 copies. So I was just wondering if the county wanted to pick up some copies and donate them to uh, Cypress County Schools and maybe the City of Medicine Hat. So I don't know, they're $15, I think. Uh, I don't know. Anybody in favor? I brought the book if you guys want to take a look. What uh, What was the cost of doing that the last time? Do we remember? And I don't remember which schools we all did. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was. I can't remember how many we bought. I think it was around 50, 50 or something. Yeah. And I don't know how much they And we were gave each. two books to each school, including Medicine Hat schools. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Just elementary so, schools, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, but what does chasing the dinosaur have to do with egg? Well, that's why I'm wondering. <laughs> so unless it's, I mean, it's because it's a, something. it's because it's a, a local author. Yeah, but she's a student. And it's about, and it's kind of based on the bones that they found in the Hilda area. That might be more of a council so decision. E well, yeah, either here yeah. or council. Yeah. yeah. It's so maybe what we should do there, Shane, is we should take and just make a motion to take it to council if, we're inter if it's something we're interested in. Yeah, because, I mean, that's... Yeah. And then come up with a, co or, and have the costs and everything prepared for them. And because that, it doesn't really fit in our... It doesn't review here, but for them, they may be interested in supporting a local author like that. Yeah. So. Like, I think it's neat to support her for sure. You know, yeah. just 12 year old gal from Hilda. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, that's what I mean. Like, it, it may, it's, it's more if it was an ag related book, I yeah. pro probably wouldn't even, we yeah. wouldn't have it, be having yeah. this conversation, but because it's not, it's going to have to come from the other end of the tool. Yeah. Pole. Yeah. And that's kind of what I expected. Yeah. And that she's a so county we'll, resident. I think the motion would be there is to take it to council and Kim can take care of that. Yeah. Okay. So you're making that a ticket? I make that motion. Okay. All in favor? Carried. <coughs> yeah, I'm going to add things to the agenda because I didn't think to put them on. So first thing we'll bring up, we had talked about it before the meeting about uh, putting 200 bucks into for our members at large to be have access to our county wardrobe thing there. You, I think you may have missed that. So like where we take and we get our hats and our yep. hoodies and coats and stuff where we have that hundred bucks to spend, put $200 budget in for Josh and Connie as well, since they represent us out in public. So is that $200 each person or total? Well, like I think it's hundred each? We, get, each. we get a hundred each. So whatever, whatever okay. the same for them, hundred each. So $200 budget. Thanks. It's kind of more and more expensive that woman and doesn't bring cookies. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I can't I can't make a motion so someone else has to make it. Shane's gonna make that. Okay, all in favor? <laughs> Carried. Did you put in there as cookies do not arrive? Well that that, that will be a yeah, defining factor. Pending. Pending on cookies. 
Yeah. Well, Indian Road Cooking. And then I guess one more thing we should probably bring up is that uh, the food truck, um, if we want to do something, if we're not going to do it with Stampede, do we want to look into bringing it to Dunmore Days or something to that effect? When's Dunmore doing their um, grand opening, like for the that center? Was that in May? Uh, that's that's a little soon, but yep. they'll be... They have done more days in July or August. July or August. August, I think it is. The first weekend in August. So you're saying that'll save from flipping pancakes and... No, we'll still do that, too. Okay. We'll still do that, but... Yeah, it's, it's more of a public education thing, so, you know, for the, the rural city slickers, I call them, we, we can bring it in for them. Okay. If, and so I guess we'll have another... Well, we know the cost per day, so I guess if we approve that budget, and if it's under, it's good. We can contact um, the Dunmore Community Association to see if they would be in favor of that. Yeah, yeah. so we'll talk with them, and then we can go from there. Yeah. It's we'll have, quite that, big, so they need uh, a spot to park it to or whatever. Yeah, they got a fair amount of real estate over there. Yeah. But, and then we can have that conversation even over email if we have to. If we've got to make a motion, then we can just bring it to the following meeting. We want to get yeah, we can always make the motion and then <coughs> back the information if it's if they're acceptable. Okay. Mm. What do you guys so want to do there? Do you want to just make? Do you want to we just? Need a motion to approve. Well, we'll need yes. So it's either a motion to contact them or a motion to approve the budget and then contact them. And if not, we can always. It doesn't matter. Like, do you want to do? Both, because I think probably we should contact and make sure that's something that they. Well, want yes, there. that it's it's going to be kind of all in one, right? So yeah. if they, we'll make the motion. If they don't want it, then we don't do don't, it. Don't right? do it. Yeah. Okay. So well, I'll make a motion that uh, we contact the Dunmore. Uh, what are they called? Yeah. Dunmore yeah. Committee. Uh, if they'd be interested in having the Food for Life trailer during their Dunmore days, and also to what address the budget or put it in our budget. It'd be supplied by the. By the egg service board. We'll get yep. if, yeah. So thirty a thirty five hundred dollar budget for it. And if uh, if we can get it cheaper, that's great, but probably should approve the max budget. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Connie? I think once they bring that truck here, they also look I was on their website and you can volunteer to like to man the truck or whatever, like to be one of the speakers there. So I was actually looking at doing that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. I just have another thing. When we were talking about... Okay, should we, we should do that motion first. Okay, I make that motion. No, Blaine made it. Blaine made it. So, <laughs> all, all in favor of that. Okay. Carried. Okay, now you can talk about whatever. So, um, Steve and Tracy helped have brought in um, a family from Lat Latvia. Latvia and she's Ukrainian so they have four kids and now I was wondering if we could send them like a welcome to Cypress County um, basket or whatever give them all a hoodie or I don't know yes we shut it off Connie there's lots around that have been brought in refugees and that I mean yeah. we can't start doing it all I mean the wife at some of these schools, I mean, they're, okay. you know, getting these kids in, and yeah. that, so they're, they're all over. I mean, yeah. if you start okay. this one family, hoodies or whatever, how about all the rest? Because there is more than yeah. just the one. I mean, yeah. I think we're opening okay. it up. Yeah. I mean, Go ahead, Kim. I mean, we could put something in the paper, you know, to refuge, but to start handing out yeah. stuff is going to be a little... Difficult to know. I know it's a good rule. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but where do you stop? Yeah, just because they seem to go mostly to Calgary or Edmonton for work wise, and then this is like in the county. But I mean, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying <clears throat> as well. I can check to see what we have for a welcome basket or see if we have something that we've been doing in the past because I know other communities it's been prevalent anyway. But that would be outside of the Agus Service Board. But yeah, yeah. it'd be more of a council thing, anyways. But there, there may be something in the swag closet that we can put together if need be. So, but probably more for a community association to be doing, anyways, than. Well, in other other organizations, they do it through FCSS. 
because it's part of their um, welcoming people. And you sit on FCS, FCS, that's correct? That's correct. Okay. So you're going to take care of that? I'll follow up and see if we have that kind of a welcome basket. And okay, yeah. cool. Perfect. So we don't need a motion to that. Okay, uh, anything else before we go on items for information? Anybody want to sponsor something random? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Okay, uh, anything in the items for information that are pertinent that we need to talk about, Lisa? Just a notice um, from Dr. Keith Lehman. He's the chief provincial vet. They're expecting avian flu to be a big thing in the south as the birds start migrating back kind of thing. Just that, just to kind of be on the lookout. Um, and the rest was kind of just letters and survey uh, reports from last year that we participated in and, and that sort of thing. So... Um, not a whole bunch there that I need to go over, I don't think. Um, the letter there about the insecticide for um, grasshoppers was drafted and emailed to all you know, those guys that were CC'd and nobody's replied to that. <laughs> but I believe it was Vulcan County sent out a support letter just like this one after ours. So there'll probably be a few more coming our way, but... Yeah, I think that's kind of it. Just a couple thank you letters and and stuff like that. So, anybody else got anything? I'm just reading this letter from Brazu County. I didn't notice before about the, the insurance, insurance increases. That's actually not a bad one. Something we're go ahead, Shane. Yeah, we should maybe write a a letter, same as Brazil, on this crop insurance. Yeah, I agree. Supporting them, okay. Yeah, they, it, that is good. well, and the prices have gone up exponentially since uh, last year too. So, okay, and it's mostly due to the drought, I'm sure, but there is a point where it's worth it too much. Go ahead, Kim. Have you seen your indexes being changed because of the three or four year droughts? Like, yes. So that was something that in my previous municipality, we, we lobbied the government and, and because of those index changes. And uh, we weren't successful with getting the index change, but what we were successful with was looking at the problem. And we, we were able to map the watershed and do different things through a Canada grant. So I don't know if your index have been changed, crop index, that there's maybe something else that we can do through the egg service board. I have to read into that a bit more before I, before I even make comments on it, I'll have to read about it or read into it. Yeah, and that was, that was just something that, you know, with indexes being changed and then it, it changes people's bottom line moving forward and because you're paying these additional crop insurance premiums, but you're not getting the the payout that's because of the index being dropped. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think I think Shane's motion was to write a letter, kind of mirror to what Brazil wrote here, yeah. and put it off to the appropriate authorities. So, all in favor of that? Carried. Uh, is there anything else? don't think so. Okay, is there anything else to come before the meeting, guys? Nope. Seeing none, uh, we'll adjourn at uh, 11.50.